One of the things that I love is that two films idea of your life. And there's like two stories you can tell. One that is safe and full of regret, and one that is risky and full of pride and joy. Uh, what Andy said about the relationship between what you consume and your brain, I'm thinking about what I consumed last night. And <laughs> it's really, really helping me to understand the state of my brain this morning. Uh, but uh, it's, it is great to be here. This is the most wonderful occasion, and I have to, along with everybody else that's doing this, thank those people that have organized it for doing so, because it's been amazing, and it's a privilege to be here. And, it, and it's actually great to be up on this stage at, at last, because the thing about doing this on Saturday, i found, is that there are two days before it, you watch other people, and then there's all this shit going around in your head that I'm now about to try and unload on you in some semblance of order. Um, but... Um, the other thing is you keep running into people as well, and they say, what do you do? And you say, restaurants. And they say, oh, the thing about restaurants is this. And they come out with something quite profound that I was going to say today. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that. It's in the words of Morrissey, stop me if you've heard this. Well, in fact, don't do that, because you, there won't be much of a talk. Um, here's the title. This is not a restaurant. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, this is Wrights. This is what I'm going to talk about, the little, a little autobiography, I suppose, of this place that, that we kind of occupy at the moment. Uh, as you, it's a beautiful, uh, you can't see much of it there, but it's a beautiful Georgian uh, country inn and was built as such in 1831. So it's been a uh, place of hospitality for the best part of 200 years and, and largely interrupted, uh, uninterrupted rather, um, until, uh, until it was bought in 2000 by the Brains Brewing Company. Uh, they were acquiring a lot of property ar around here, and the story of this place is very similar to many of the other properties they acquired. They ushered in 10 years of mediocrity and gradual decline, <laughs> till they eventually closed it uh, in 2010 to cut their losses, and imaginatively applied for planning permission to turn the site into housing. Um, which is when we were lucky enough to acquire it just before, before that happened. For, I mean, I have to say, for the um, remarkably, I think, fair sum of £275,000, which when you think this, is, this place is 10 bedrooms and uh, the downstairs is enormous, it's quite extraordinary, but actually there are loads. If, you, if you'd like what I say, you can go and buy your own country pub because the, you, if you've driven down through the countryside, it, you'll probably have seen half a dozen of them closed along, along your way. Um, so when we acquired it, it looked more like that. It's not a very good picture, is it? But there we are. Uh, it's kind of... Um, it's a bleak picture. Of a, it was a bleak scene. It's all boarded up and, uh, and, and, and messy. And what was one of the reasons we got it for £275,000 was that people kept coming in and looking at it and just thinking, oh, this needs a shitload of work done. Um, but I, 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 I mean, I know nothing about it, but it didn't look like that to me. And that's one of the interiors uh, when we acquired it. Uh, here's another one. It was just messy. Um, but actually, I could sort of see that it wouldn't take all that much, although brains had been... This is incredible, actually. So negligent. You know, a company of that size, I think they turn over in the region of £15 million a year, something like that. I don't know, that's a profit. They, make, they turn over like £100 million a year. And they just left this place. And they didn't even drain the water out of the pipes. So, so there was a hard winter, everything popped, the place got flooded. They'd even left food in the kitchen. This is three years. And so, you know, the kind of wildlife that likes that kind of thing had been in and <laughs> made themselves at home. It was just extraordinary. I couldn't understand why they would do that and have that kind of, um, you know, no sense of integrity about what they were doing. But anyway, we, we, we kind of benefited from it because it put a lot of people off and we moved in and, and did a sort of five-week makeover on it. It was literally five weeks. And, and uh, you know, it's nice on the surface. <laughs> uh, th this is um, one of the dining rooms, and, uh, and of which there are. It's, a, it's kind of a real rabbit warren of a place. This is another uh, uh, place you can eat that's got records. It's all hipster stuff, obviously. <laughs> uh, we, we're doing, this is ages ago, mine. You know, we all, uh, it's craft beer. Camden, look, with Mr. Bingo stuff on. Brilliant. Uh, and we sell, it's also a retail, so we sell wine as well. And you can, s you basically sit in the shop and eat. Uh, oh, there's some cakes. We make lots of cakes. It's a big cake table, just giving you an idea. This is a menu, the shop area, a couple of people eating. That's kind of what it looks like. You come and look at the board. It changes every day. 
uh, and then you order. So oh, that's, that's our best customer, Dion Davis. He's, uh, uh, he, three years ago, he was slender. Uh, actually, it's worth, he is Wales' greatest pantomime dame. He, he shaves the beer off for that. But if you, uh, honestly, if you go to Torch Theatre, if you're in this area at Christmas, fantastic. Uh, oh, and this is where we are. And, and actually, you know, it's not the middle of nowhere, but it is, there is a point to this. It's fairly remote. Uh, in the, Carmarthen's a town of about 15,000, 17,000 people, I think. Clandilo, which is on the other side of this map, we're between the two, that's about 2,000 people. The village we're in is a couple of hundred. The, the nearest city would be Swansea, which is about 30 miles away. Um, there's not a huge population in the area. And, 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 and that's kind of why I'm here, I suppose, in a way, because, um, because uh, this is the showing off bit. I'm not comfortable with this, but otherwise you don't know why I'm here, do you? Because it's like, why? So there's this pub, you did it up. So I have to, I have to, uh, okay, uh, 70, we did 75,000, we had 75,000 people, more than that actually, we did 75,000 covers last year uh, in that location. And just to put that in context, uh, the National Botanic Garden of Wales, which apparently is one of our great, is one of our great visitors, I've got to be positive about this, Andy's looking at me angry, uh, it is, you must go there. Um, that... That, is, that gets 110,000 visitors. So, you know, it's because we're actually not far from it, and quite often people say to us, this, is, this sounds really bad, actually, but uh, they, they say to us, did you get a lot of business from the Botanic Gardens? And I said, well, probably less than they get from us, to be honest. But, uh, um, and, uh, but we get... So the, a lot of people come. I hadn't expected this. this uh, uh, please don't get the impression at any time that I... I'm some kind of business genius, and we planned all this. It's, I'm telling you all this in retrospect. Uh, we employ 20 full-time staff now, uh, miles more than anything I've ever done before. And, um, and then we, win lots of, we won lots of awards. Uh, the, the thing about awards is, you, you probably know this anyway, but they feed off each other. So you win a couple, you will start to win all the other ones, because the people do it at a desk in London. They don't actually come out or anything. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've just got to get that first one or first two, <laughs> and then and you're away. Uh, so we, and we do win awards. We just had the National Restaurant Awards, and according to that, we are the 70th best restaurant uh, in the whole of the UK, which is nonsense. I mean, St John wasn't even on the list, and it was crazy. Um, and Yotam Otolenghi likes us. Now, that does mean something to me, because he came down to do the food programme with Sheila Dillon, two heroes of mine, about a month ago, and um, he really did love it, and I love him. And so we loved each other, and it was all great. <laughs> it was all really, really great. Um, but the thing is, all that, says, all that stuff all says restaurant, and this is the title of the talk, this is not a restaurant. And um, I called it that partly because this was a, the title of one of those internet reviews that you get. <laughs> you know, this is not a restaurant. <laughs> it then went on to list all the things that we... we don't do, uh, that, they, that these people clearly would have liked us to have done, uh, uh, like put menus on the table, like pour their wine, I don't know. The staff were wearing jeans, they didn't like the music. So the, uh, actually, the, the whole thing is, I mean, I don't read those things, generally speaking, but the whole thing was completely accurate. There wasn't anything, you know, I couldn't argue with it. They just didn't like it. And, and as far as they were concerned, their concept of a restaurant wasn't being met, which made me think about you know, what we were, and, and about the word restaurant. I also like it because if you say this in a certain way, you know, this is not a restaurant. It, it reminds me of my mother. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's the same as, this is not a hotel. You come in, you come in for lunch, you've been playing football in the morning, and you, and you come in for lunch, and you go, what's for lunch? Soup. Oh, I don't want soup. This is not a restaurant. So, but... I feel like saying that sometimes. This <laughs> is not. Um, but it, it, the other thing about it is, is that it re kind of reflects where my mind was before we started this place, because I'd been in the restaurant industry for 20 years at that point, I, sort of taking part in running places. Um, I'd also worked as a, a restaurant critic for five years. Uh, I worked on Ramsey's Kitchen Nightmares as the restaurant consultant, trying to help. Gordon fixed very bad restaurants for, I did that for nearly 10 years on and off. 
And, and we were running a place called Apollin, which is a, which is a small country restaurant, again, set in a pub, uh, just down the road from where we are now, really. And uh, it was very lovely, but very much more um, a conventional restaurant offering, starters, mains, desserts. You know, people came in, they spent 30, 40 quid a head. It, and it was nice. The food was good. We won lots of awards. Uh, <laughs> And, 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 you know, it was well-reviewed, and it was still going nicely. You know, people were coming in, and they were lovely people, and they were enjoying themselves, and they'd go away and tell you how much they loved it. But for me, I started to feel like I was going through the motions. In other words, the, the love had kind of died. It was becoming a, a loveless marriage, if you like. And, um, and, and, and I got to that point where I just really wasn't enjoying it. I couldn't work out why, and we decided to sell our, our share in, in that restaurant. So we, we sort of left the trade. And then we did... Um, what you kind of do, I think, when you, well, I do anyway, when you suddenly come into a small, at least a small amount of money, which is we went on a trip. So uh, I just got to remember what slide comes out. Yeah, we went to um, New York, um, uh, amongst other places, but New York in particular, and in particular to Brooklyn. Now, uh, I have to say that it was my son who said we need to go to Brooklyn because it pains me to say it. By this point in uh, the, um, our evolution, <laughs> He, w he had his finger on the pulse more than I did. And, and five or six years ago when we did that, although Brooklyn was only just starting to influence what was happening in London, I didn't really know much about that. And, and it wasn't as well known and the scene wasn't as well known, certainly over here as it was now. So it, it was a kind of surprise to me that I was thinking, yeah, there's these places, these restaurants, we need to go in Manhattan. And Joe was like, no, we need to go over to Brooklyn to see these other places. And it was in Brooklyn that, uh, that we conceived of, of, of what we do now. Uh, it's an interesting thing because uh, I, w sometimes when things are conceived in Brooklyn, they get named after them, don't they? So <laughs> we couldn't be rights, we could be Brooklyn, but I don't think so. <laughs> um, and, it, and actually, that conception happened, it was more specific than, than just Brooklyn. It was in a, particular, in a particular place, and I can actually remember the time very well. And it was this place. It's a place called Feta Sal, which is a barbecue joint uh, in Williamsburg. Uh, that um, is in an old mechanics, car mechanics workshop. And uh, basically, the, the score here is that you queue up for your food with a tray and a bit, it's got a bit of butcher's paper on it. And they do the most amazing barbecue, native breed pork, brisket, chicken, that kind of thing. It looks like that, they will. Uh, and, and you buy it by weight. Yes, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, you buy it by weights and you choose your sides and all that kind of thing, and then you go sit down on communal tables. Uh, you got there's no uh, there's no crockery as such. Uh, you get proper cutlery and and there's a bar and it's absolutely fantastic. And it was at that bar that I was that's not me anywhere there. No. Um, but uh, it was at this bar that I was sat uh, uh, on my own. I hadn't fallen out with the rest of the party. There just wasn't any room on the table. And, uh, and I like to sit at the bar. And I was looking at the kind of 40-odd bourbons that they've got there, and they're talking to the bartender, and there's 12 craft beers. You see those knives behind there? That's where all the fantastic place. And, uh, and this guy walked in and uh, just, just came straight through the door, didn't have anything to eat, came straight to the bar, and he said to the barman, he said, um, have you got a Budweiser? And the barman said, no, we don't have Budweiser. We have these 12 craft beers, and, uh, and you know, there's... This, is, this one's like this, this one's like that, you might want one of those. And the guy said, mm, Miller Lite? And the guy said, no, we don't have Miller Lite. But the, <laughs> the closest thing, maybe a good introduction to you, for you would be Brooklyn Lager. That's probably the best thing. You're probably going to like that, but it had cause. Uh, and the barman just looked him in the eyes and he said, hey, buddy, he said, uh, you're in the wrong place. There's a place three doors down, you're going to love it, and they're going to love you. <laughs> and... <laughs> And, and, it, and it, it really, and, and the guy left, and it, and, and it really came to me in a flash what, what, what the problem had become for me with restaurants, is, and it was that we were doing far too much of what the customer wanted, or what we perceived the customer to want, and nowhere near enough of what we wanted to do. And, uh, and, and, and so that's the idea that we came back with. Um, and, and basically just thought, what the hell, let's do what we want to do. So I'm just going to talk briefly um, about some of the things that underpin what we do because, you know, it is basically a delicatessen cafe uh, offering. Um, <laughs> I, notice I didn't say restaurant. Um, and, but there are some things that kind of lie behind it, I think, that, that sort of encapsulate what we believe and, and therefore how it looks. 
Um, the first of which is the importance of the food itself. I mean, this might seem the bleeding obvious, but if you've seen as many bad restaurants as I, as I have, and well, we've all seen loads of them, they, they, you know, people will concentrate on the interior design and they'll, you know, and think last about what the food should be like. It should be the food that drives everything, in, in my view. And it's also frustrating how much shit gets talked about food, generally speaking, you know, it, the pretension that surrounds it, particularly as far as, uh, as presentation is concerned. You know, people say, oh, you eat with your eyes. Well, you, you know, trust me, don't do it. It was a bloody mess. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and whilst it's important that food, whilst it's important that food looks good, you know, you may have noticed that really good food looks, you saw those barbecue, they haven't thought too much about presentation. It all looks great. The reason it looks great is because it's cooked beautifully and your mind is telling you that is going to taste great. You don't have to arrange it into towers and smears and all that kind of thing. Or, you know, or do, or it's like great British menu. And they, the food has to be witty, you know, witty. Food is comedy. Oh, look, here, it looks like an egg, but it's really a trifle. You know, it's a, it's, it, it, that's not where, where it's at. I'm trying to remember which slide it's next. It's, it's not like that at all. And I, and, I, and I do get, you know, I mean, I understand that you kind of, there are some people doing some very interesting things with the concepts of food. And, but generally speaking, it, it's not a good thing. But I did think about this a little bit. Where, where is it going after, you know, dry ice and, and um, ants and dinosaur DNA or whatever it is at the moment? And I've come up with a really, I came up with a really, really good, I hope it's a really, really good dish. I think this is like Michelin three stars, definitely great British menu winner. It's perfect. And I was inspired here by, uh, you know, the John Cage uh, composition, four minutes and 33 seconds? Okay, well, I, I call this 21.5 centimeters uh, or the end of cooking. It's perfect. How can you criticize that? Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, that will, someone will do that and they'll be charging £27.50 for it. <laughs> I've got to speed up. Um, good cooking. That's what I think good cooking is. Uh, great ingredients, cooked accurately with care and sympathy, and put together in combinations that work. When I, when I used to work as a, uh, on a, when I edited a food guide, that was basically what we used to say to the inspectors to go out and look for, first of all. Because after you've, when you've done that, you've eliminated 95% of the restaurants in the UK. So, you know, your guidebook's written for you. But those are the things that we, we, we should be concentrating on. And that's what I mean about great sandwich, because sandwich is, you know, sandwich is fantastic. You don't actually get any better than a sandwich. A sandwich, what's important in a sandwich? The bread. People miss these kind of basic things. So if you're thinking about what makes a great sandwich, you've got to make some great bread first. So, you know, and decide what is the best bread for that sandwich. You know, it's, that's the work that you have to do. That's the thought that you need to put in. And, you know, we, we, before we open rights, we devised one particular sandwich, which uh, there's the bread when it's baked, obviously, uh, which is this one, uh, which is called the pork belly cubano. Cubanos you find in Miami. If you've seen the film Chef, the, uh, there's a lot of cubano making in that. They're generally a uh, press sandwich with kind of quite processed ingredients, usually processed ham, cheese, and pork belly. So we've made a middle-class version here uh, with slow-cooked pork belly, gammon ham, uh, some organic cheddar, some cowboy pickles, uh, a little bit of spicy mayo, and it goes in this chia bat bun, and it's a really nice thing, and it's the thing that we sell most of. And in my opinion, you know, I'm not saying this one in particular, but if you make a great sandwich, food doesn't get any better. Michelin starred food isn't any better than that. It's just different, and that's the, that's the key thing. Uh, I'm conscious of oh, service not included. I really hate the word service. Uh, why should the people that work with me feel that they have to go and serve somebody? I mean, is that what we're really about? It's that just that relationship. You come in, you give me money, and I give you money, and you, I, you, you do my bidding. It's not like that. We try and have a place where, you know, people, uh, we're all proud of what we do and what we've created, uh, and we want to welcome people into that place and show them what we do and help them to enjoy the experience too. It's much more along those lines. And for me, it's like the customer has to be happy but actually, the first thing is that the people who work there have to be happy. There's no chance of the customers being happy unless we're happy. So we have to be really happy and then hope that the customer's happy, too. Um, oh, look, there's a star. <laughs> well, there's a few of them, anyway. Build it and wait. You can't be... Uh, people are very impatient. I've been involved in a couple of restaurant projects and don't get everything doesn't go the way they want it to go in the first few weeks. You have to do what you believe in and then you have to wait for it to happen. 
you have to have that patience to build your customer base for the, base for the right people to come in. It's really misunderstood this, and, and, uh, and I think, and it says something about location as well, because, you know, actually being not in the middle of nowhere, that, look, there's a dual carriageway not very far away, so, and the M4's not that far away, but, it, you know, being relatively romantic, pe <laughs> I lied, people, <laughs> people have got to make the effort to come to you, and it's much better if they, you don't want to be, people go, on, location, location. I can't imagine anything worse than having loads of people passing by and then think, oh, let's pop in there and see what it's about. Can you imagine all that disappointment you've got to deal with, with all those people that are there and it's not their thing? What you want is people coming in that it is their thing. And, and, and the best way to do that is word of mouth, and social media, to me, is extended word of mouth, so that works well for us. One thing, we, that's a bin. We don't do advertising at all, and that's what we call our advertising budget, which is the bin in the kitchen so that... You know, we don't put things out that aren't up to what we think they should be, you know, the standard that we think they should be, and we call that our advertising budget, so there it is. Uh, uh, and finally, love, not money. I mean, that sounds trite, I know, um, and everybody says they do it, but it's the truth. It's been said several times over the last few days. I think Mr. Bingo said it, first of all, you do it for the love and you hope, you know, you don't chase the money and you hope the money chases you to a point. The money is what, you know, the money is what oils it. But the engine is, in fact, love. Because, and we're lucky to be in that position. And we have to try and make everybody who works with us be in that position. Because what we want is the people that come in to love us because we all want to be loved. Uh, and that's it, really. Uh, also, I thought I'd show you a picture of some other dishes to show that we don't just do sandwiches. <laughs> and uh, we're on your way home, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.